I imagine that the recording is working now, so hello everyone and welcome. I'm Harold Jarkey, and today we're going to do an introduction to PKM, Personal Knowledge Management. So what I'd like to do is just run over a couple of um, ad administrative uh, functions here, is that uh, we're going to use Twitter as the back channel. Uh, so on Twitter, if you use the hashtag, so the pound symbol SLC webinar, then other people will be able to follow it and we'll be able to search by that. And uh, you have my Twitter handle here and Jane Hart, who is at C4LPT. And so Jane, what are you going to be doing today? Well, hi everybody. Yes, well, I'm going to be uh, trying to monitor the Twitter back channel and uh, keeping an eye open on the questions coming in. And I'm hoping to feed them into Harold View as we uh, talk as you talk and perhaps at the end we can have some conversation as well so if you have any questions just uh, either pop them into the q a in the section on the right hand side in the in the go to webinar control panel or uh, pop them into twitter and i'll i'll try and keep an eye out for how it's going so that's what i'm going to be doing right great thanks jane so the basic way that we're going to run through this is the first part is going to be mostly me speaking um, it's one of the limitations of having a large number of people and the limitations of not having uh, an integrated uh, chat with uh, GoToWebinar. and uh, so i'm going to present i'm going to talk about some of the uh, uh, main uh, considerations around personal knowledge management and then when and during that time, I would uh, suggest that if you have any questions or any ideas pop into your head, get them into the Twitter stream or put them into uh, the questions. And then when I finish that part, uh, we'll pause and uh, then we'll take a look at what those questions are. We'll try to address as many as possible. And if we have time, we might even be able to bring some other people in if they want to use the audio function on that. So once again, thank you very much for attending. And here we are, we're off to the races. Presume that you know who I am, uh, which is probably why you signed up, or maybe you had nothing else to do today. Um, anyway, all the information about me is on my website, jarkey.com, and uh, you, can, uh, you can find out to your heart's content about that. What I'd like to talk about first is what got us here. Uh, Jane and I have been working together uh, through the Internet Time Alliance now for uh, over three years. And starting late last, late in 2011, we were discussing um, how we were able to sort of talk to our audiences, how we were able to connect with people, uh, both sort of from the business side and also from the social networking side uh, on, on how do we remain professional? How do we engage in uh, deep uh, conversations uh, around the things that we're interested in? And of course, social learning in the workplace is, is a big part of that. So in January, we decided that uh, we would uh, field test some uh, some workshops, some online workshops. And uh, I had been running face-to-face uh, -face workshops on personal knowledge management for several years. And usually what happened was that um, a company would hire me and then I would run a half-day or a one-day workshop and uh, for 20, 30 people, whatever. And I would get paid for that. And, uh, and it was, you know, I thought that was kind of like a standard business model. One of the problems with that, though, was that the people who were hiring me in a lot of cases weren't the people who could really um, benefit from it because I wasn't dealing individually with people. And also that there were significant gaps in terms of um, uh, who you could talk to. You had to go through corporate purchasing and things like that. And we thought, you know, maybe a better model would be to sort of go direct to the participant and eliminate the middleman. And so we started uh, running a number of um, workshops. I, I tested out personal knowledge management. Uh, Jane has done several other ones around on social media. And since January, we've had about 250 people participate in uh, one or more of our workshops. And our model there is to try to reach the, the largest group of people possible and to keep the price as low as possible and still make this a, a, a viable venture for us because this is part of how we make our living. So we have started 
this series now doing the one month uh, session per topic uh, as a new idea and personal knowledge management is the first one that we're doing and we have several others uh, and then if you go to the social learning center you'll see the other ones that that we're doing and so the format is um, a, a month dedicated to a topic uh, it's uh, so four weeks of, of workshop and every topic starts off with one of these free webinars to give people a taste of uh, what everything is, is about and again to make it a, a, as accessible as possible to as many people. And most of these, this, the information is actually available on the web. It just takes a while to put it together, to structure it, and then also to find people to, uh, to discuss it with. And uh, that's the idea behind uh, the workshops. So I'm going to roll into uh, personal knowledge management and give you an outline of, you know, what it is for me. Um, and, you know, in the long run, if you've been practicing PKM or things like PKM, and some people call this network learning, um, the uh, personal learning environments are related to this, uh, the personal learning networks. But really, for me, it boils down to two things, and that's a way in which I can make sense of all the information that I have around me, and how can I use that to get things done. So simply put, PKM is sense making plus getting things done. It's personal. It's about knowledge, and the management aspect is not is about how I manage it, not any not not how somebody else manages me. So it's not like traditional knowledge management. We're not managing the knowledge per se. We're managing ourselves as we work with knowledge. So this figure is a way uh, that I like to explain the continuum of the types of learning in the workplace. So you can see that from uh, the bottom to the top, so you have independent learning supported by tools and information of which personal knowledge management, I think is an essential part of it. It's the foundation as far as I'm concerned for knowledge workers who work in more and more networked workplaces and, and, and more networked world. Um, performance support are tools that uh, we use to help us get the job done, giving us the right information at the right time to the right person. Um, and then in the more social and collaborative interdependent work, which PKM fits into, and I'll be talking about that, are the uh, communities of practice that are focused usually around an area of practice, such as um, uh, chief learning officers could be a community of practice, and then broader professional networks like ASTD, CSTD, or a number of these other uh, professional associations. And then we have dependent instruction, which is where unfortunately too much effort in most organizations goes and that's the learning management system the courses and things like that and that when you when you look at this is that anywhere between 80 and 95 percent is below the dotted line so that pkm helps to inform and, and, and helps individuals to develop frameworks in which they can make sense of all the other things that they are doing supporting their performance at work, engaging in communities of practice, and engaging with professional networks. So the framework that I came up with several years ago uh, called Seek, Sent, Share, and the reason that it's called Seek, Sent, Share is that because people can remember it. My original frameworks that I worked with, I've been doing this for about eight years now, uh, I, I had seven step models and it was quite complicated and people didn't remember it. And that when I came up with Seek, Sense, Share, the important thing was is that people could remember it. And so I think that's, that's, that's really important. So that is what informs the three major types of activities that I think are necessary to make sense. And PKM, as I'm talking about it today, um, is about using digital web networked technologies right it is much bigger than that and it can be it doesn't have to be uh, using online tools but that's the focus of uh, of what we'll be talking about anybody wants to talk about other aspects of it that's fine but just so you know is that we're not saying that pkm doesn't exist outside of uh, networked uh, tools and technologies but that is the focus here because that is what my observation has been is is where there is a um, uh, a lack of skills and experience uh, it, in, in a lot of places. So I actually think more and more that 
PKM or managing your learning is becoming essential for work. And I wrote a post a little way a while ago is that instead of asking for people's resumes or their CV when they apply for a job, is it really we should ask, be asking them, how do you actually learn? Because I think that that's the most important thing as we uh, deal with more and more complex and creative types of uh, issues at work. It's not what you know, it's how quickly can you learn something new. And you see that in the programming world where uh, maybe they want to hire somebody to uh, for a certain programming language. That person doesn't have that language, but you know they've learned six different languages already. So chances are that we can hire this person and that person can pick up the, the, the next language. Why? Because they have the ability to learn programming languages fast. And I think that that is critical in more and more fields of employment. So seek, send, share, we start with the seek part. Okay, what, what is seeking? Yeah, go ahead. Harold, can I, just, can I just interrupt you a bit there? There's a few people saying they're having little problems with sound. I wonder if you could speak just a little bit louder. Okay, sorry. I'm just let me just check and see. I've got my sound up. I have the mic on. Is that any better, Jane? Jane, am I any louder? A little bit louder for me. Hopefully, some people might uh, respond. Uh, we had a okay. Few so let's see if they let us know. Uh, um, yeah. It's better, yes. Good, thanks. Uh, just checking to see, is there any, maybe there's a go-to webinar thing. No, that's not it. Okay, checking that. It's showing me as uh, green bars all the way to the max. So I, I, the system, I'm not too sure why the audio is low like that. But sorry, I can't, I can't increase it a whole bunch more right now. Okay, the seek part. So seeking is about curiosity, I think. And... The more that I use web uh, tools and sources of information like uh, RSS um, aggregators or Twitter or LinkedIn or any of these other social networks, is that it, it, is it, over the years what I've noticed is that it's more about finding people than it is about finding information. So seek out interesting people I think is probably the key to starting your personal knowledge management. So who is interesting, who is, uh, has a depth of knowledge in a certain area, and who is already sharing. So you find those people who are doing that, and you can start assembling almost your network of those of those people. So I'm interested in somebody in e-learning or somebody who's doing stuff in the field of uh, uh, what do they call that? Social or of analytics. Okay. Well, who, who, so, so, so I can go and I can find who's talking about that kind of stuff. And as opposed to finding, you know, going to the journal of analytics, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to find the people who are sharing that already. And I'm going to connect with them on whatever social medium they're using. Google plus Twitter, um, a blog, uh, who, Facebook, who knows? Okay. So that, so that's the seeking part is, it, it, it really, it is a people centric thing because once you get to know a person, you get to know where they're coming from, you get to understand their biases, and then you can start balancing how you're going to get uh, your information um, from, 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 a, from a, a wide enough variety of sources so that you, so you, you, you're not in what they call an echo chamber. The sense making part, I think, is the most important, and that is that. You can seek out all the information that you want and you can have 5,000 bookmarks and you can have Pinterest pages of things stuck all, uh, all over the place. But if you don't actually spend some time physically or mentally processing that information and doing something with it, uh, what I call an expression medium, then I think that you're missing out on a, on, on, on a critical part of of, of, of knowledge management or, or, or making your own knowledge. And uh, I mean, the Albert Einstein quote is here, is that you have to figure out how you can use your brain. In my case, it's my blog, is that I, I, I gather information from uh, my, my RSS aggregators, I use social bookmarks, I'm on Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn, um, I'm in a number of different uh, like Yammer social cast communities, and I get information from a, a variety of sources. But for me, writing a blog post is my really important part of making sense. Um, the blog, writing a blog is not for everyone. 
but I think what's really important is to find an expression medium for you. Is it how am I actually going to spend some time to make some sense of this? It could be making lists. It could be assembling things together. It could be doing some filtering and finding the best of those kinds of things but you need to find some kind of an expression medium. And there's a wide variety of those. And with web tools today is that, I mean, you really do have uh, a, a, a great choice. So it, uh, I think there's something for everyone. And finally, on the share side is that I think that none of this makes any sense unless we share. And I've said before that PKM is our part, the individual's part of the social learning contract. Right? Because if nobody shared, we wouldn't have Wikipedia. If no one shared, we wouldn't have some, all, some of those great instructional videos on YouTube. If no one shared, we wouldn't have WikiHow. It's that sharing that shows our humanity, that connects us with other people. And what do we usually share? Is that we share what we're passionate about. So we can share also with people who share our passions, right? And that they can build upon that so that when I write a blog post, someone else who shares a passion for social learning may say, you know, Harold, I think that's really good, but did you think about this? Right? And so what we're doing is that we are publishing, we're commenting on what other people publish, and we're participating within that social flow. It's like being at the world's biggest cocktail party. So another way that I've looked at Seek, Sent, Share, is if you look on the left-hand side, is that there, when you seek, going from seeking to sensing, you've got to do some filtering, right? Because you can't, if you, all that information coming in, uh, you have to figure out how you're going to deal with it. You have to filter it out. We can't deal with everything. We can't deal with the, the gigabytes of information that are coming through. So we need to we need to set up effective filters. And that's one of the things that we talk about in the workshop, or what are the types of filters that we can set up, and how can we do, uh, and, and what's the kind of filter that's going to work for me. The sense-making part is we have to create something. We're creating uh, a list, we're creating a presentation, we're creating a blog post, we're creating a tweet. It's actually creating something. And then in sharing, we have to discern who we're going to share with. Well, this is appropriate for this group and not this group. And we have to discern also when we're going to share with them. Because if you're always sharing everything, then all of a sudden you become more noise than signal, right? And no one's going to be listening to you. And that doesn't help you in having an effective knowledge network because if no one's listening to you, no one's connecting to you, uh, then you are not going to be part of these, these knowledge networks. You're not going to be seen as a contributor. And if this is in a workplace, you're going to be left out of, uh, of, of the conversation. So on the right-hand side is that we seek out from our networks. We filter through our communities. We create by working or being or doing or living. Um, and, so, and then we, what we've created, we share back out through our communities and back out through our networks. And the same model I've shown represented differently graphically. And you'll, you'll see that a lot from me is you'll get, you'll get multiple representations of the same thing as I'm sort of working what I call half-baked ideas through my mind and seeing whether or not this is a good way to represent something. So if you go from the top to the bottom is that we seek out through our wider networks. We filter that through our, the COP, our communities of practice, and through our teams. We make sense of it by creating something we discern who to share, the team level, the community level, uh, and the network level. So we go from outside, bring it inside, and then put it back out, outside again. Right? That's the general, so it's filtering, creating, and discerning. Um, I think that that's a, an easy way to, uh, uh, to, to, to talk about PKM at the high level. And I'm always interested in feedback on whether or not these models and metaphors make any sense. There's an old saying that says, uh, all models are flawed, but some are useful. So I know that there are flaws in all of these, but if it's useful, we can use it for a little while. Probably the big mental image uh, that I think is really important with this is giving up control. A lot of people, when they come to this, come to Twitter, RSS, or anything like that, say, well, how do you read all these tweets? And I say, well, actually, I don't. Uh, it's that you have to sort you have to give up control in terms of I'm not going to be able to read everything. I'm going to miss some things. But you know what? If if I have an effective network, if it's really important, it will come back to me. 
right? And so part of, part of it is building up a resilient enough network so that the really important stuff that's important either for your job or your field of practice, your profession, um, sooner or later will come back to you because you're having good conversations, good connections, you're, you have good search tools, you can find things, and you can always ask your network and say, hey, does anybody know about this or remember where this was? So it's by, by building a resilient learning network is that you don't have to be totally in control of it all the time, which I think is quite important. I think it's also important to develop your own process. So the models that I show are ones that I've developed that work for me. And I would never say to someone, this is what you have to follow. This is what you have to do. The P in personal knowledge management is a capital P. It is, uh, you have to find out what works for you. Because if you don't practice this on a regular basis, daily, weekly, uh, whatever works for you, uh, then it then, then it's, it's, it's just going to be, you know, like um, shelfware, you know, software that sits on the shelf that nobody uses. So um, what I, when I work with people on this is that, you know, the, the key part is to have enough back and forth conversations to find out, okay, what is it that, you know, try this or maybe do that and, you know, try something a little bit different. And, uh, you know, the basic premise is start small. Don't try to do all these things at once, which I think is really important. Um, so this right here, uh, Urs Fry, who was, I think, on the last PKM workshop, but was on a workshop that Jay Cross and I ran six years ago. It was called the Informal Unlearning Online Workshop, and we had a lot of fun doing it. Anyway, uh, PKM was one of the subjects then six years ago, and Urs came up with this, right? So it's not the one that I use. It's this continuing spiral where first you retrieve, and you can see then you evaluate, organize, analyze, compose, present, publish, engage in dialogue, and then continue around through that. And so for Urs, uh, who's in Switzerland, that made a lot of sense. And I think it's great. And I have a collection of, uh, of several of these that uh, different people have used uh, uh, in, in time. So I think what's important, I think Seek, Send, Shares is, is a good starting point, but it's not one that you have to use. And uh, some of the other tools and things and the, and the metaphors and the models, uh, use what works, discard what doesn't work. So the workshop itself that we're going to be doing um, is going to have four sections to it. Uh, there's the, the there's the framework itself. So I'll be talking in in depth uh, about seeking, uh, looking at different types of tools, whether you want to be using um, uh, uh, judgment uh, uh, filters, whether you want to be using mechanical filters. You know, is it better to uh, to be using tools like Google for you, uh, and which is a, which uses mechanical filters, or is it better to have uh, a number of people or a number of experts where I get my information from? And then we're going to talk a lot about tools because there are there's a huge amount of tools. It's not a problem of finding a tool; it's a problem of limiting yourself so that you're not overwhelmed with tools. Then there's the part on finding your voice, which is the uh, 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 the sense making process is that what is the expression medium that I can use that is going to make sense for me? Um, I've noticed that when Twitter came along and these other microblogging uh, uh, tools like like the Yammer, the Social Cast, uh, Jive, somewhat uh, uh, Chatter, is that it's a lot easier to share a 140 character tweet than it is to write a blog post of three paragraphs, right? Because there's composition and time and things like that. So uh, that I think has really brought about the explosion in narrating your work and in sharing what you're doing and in expressing things online uh, with your communities of practice, with your, with, with, with your networks. So some of these tools are relatively, uh, are relatively easy. Then, uh, or, um, so that's the, fi the finding your voice. And then finally, the network weaving. Um, and the network weaving is how do I build my network? How do I then help others within the network connect or what some people call closing the triangles in that, you know, I know Jane and I know Jay, but Jay and Jane don't know each other. So how do I say, hey, you two should, should talk because you're both interested in this, in, in this area, uh, which uh, being a, a network weaver makes you a, a valuable um, part of your, your your, your work team, your community of practice, and your professional networks. So we're going to talk about that and things like um, uh, unfollowing, 
because uh, that's also important is that sometimes you have to cull your network and um, uh, uh, because sometimes we get overwhelmed with it and that happens from time to time we're bringing in new t new tools and, and we'll talk about those kinds of things the core of the workshop though and this is something that you don't have to do within the workshop you can you can do yourself but what we provide is sort of a, a, a loose um, hand in a constrained space that forces people to have conversations. And there's only one rule that we have within any of our workshops, and that is, is that all conversations have to be in public or within within the, uh, the workshop group. And there's a lot of value to that. Um, some people who don't participate at all or they don't write anything at all, they still are able to see everything else and read what other people have shared. And then, and then later they come back and they say, yeah, you know, I really learned a lot about that, but I just wasn't ready to sort of to sort of jump in. So there's room for lurkers, there's room for people who talk and share a lot, and for anybody in, in between as well. And then what uh, Jane and I do is that uh, we try to um, help and uh, make make those connections. We do the network weaving as well, saying, oh, you're talking about that, have you looked at this? And bringing in the appropriate uh, kinds of resources or suggestions. So if you don't talk about what you're doing, we can't help you. And that, I think, is the nature of anyone who works in a network. I mean, unless you all work in the same office, is that no one can help you unless they know what you're doing. And PKM, the, the share part of it, shows it, it, other people what it is that you're passionate about, what you're, what you're thinking about. And uh, sometimes, you know, there's a lot of things that go get posted and no one looks at them. But what I find interesting is that sometimes I will, I will have written a blog post five, seven years ago, and then someone picks it up and says, you know, this is really pertinent. And then we have a conversation around that. Well, if I hadn't posted that, then we wouldn't have been able to have that conversation. And I think what PKM does is that it enables us to have better conversations, which is important for getting complex and creative work done. So that's pretty well it. And I'm just trying to see how do I, well, making sure I click on the right things here. There we are on that. Um, I can, I'm still sharing my screen here, Jane, so I can always open things up as well. So I can get into... Uh, Twitter and see what's up there. Are you are you on line there, Jane? Yeah, oh, I'm still are. here. Um, okay, I'm I'm, I'm going to go into Twitter. Chat. Yeah, I'm just going in so the, we can um, see the chat. The, uh, and also look at the questions. Um, okay. There's an early question that I thought you might be interested in from e tutorial right back at the beginning. Uh, which asks, um, are PLE and PKM more or less the same? Now, you probably explained the difference for about the difference between PLE and PKM, but perhaps you might want to say another few words about it. Yeah, I think I, I wrote a blog post on that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you have a blog post on everything, I think. <laughs> Um, I think they're the same thing. As this, for me, PKM came about. I was inspired by the work that Lilia Afamova was doing uh, back in 2003, um, and she was writing about um, bloggers uh, who were uh, sharing. Um, she she's, uh, did her PhD thesis looking at about a dozen bloggers who were using uh, PKM as a sense-making method by which they could then share and make sense about their area. Of, uh, of work, which was around knowledge management. Um, and, and so it was blogging, PKM, and those kinds of things. And so for me, PKM, it has, my focus has always been on workplace learning. So I see PKM as taking control of your professional development. So most people who talk about PLEs or PLNs usually look at it from a formal or an institutional type of a setting, and I stay away from that. Um, I think that if you had a PKM system that was entirely within the corporate walls that you couldn't take with you, it wouldn't be a real PKM system. So, uh, so that for me is, is, is the big difference. It's, it's, it's not wrapped around uh, formal training. It's not wrapped around certification, though it could be supporting those kinds of things. But it's more about lifelong, continuous professional development, though there is an aspect also of personal development. Um, so anyway, that's that's my focus, and you know, I think that they're they're blurred edges between all of these. 
thanks. And in fact, the tutorial is Maria. So Maria, thanks for that question. Now, the other thing, one of the ones I noticed when we were uh, I was looking at the um, Twitter chat was from Jack, Jack Vincent, and mm -hmm. he said, "Hi, Jack." <laughs> Yeah, he's another Canadian, I think. Yeah. Uh, no, he's um, in Boston. He's in Boston. Oh, I apologize. Okay, and he said something like, um, "In 2002, your PCAM includes teaching people how to use email well." And the reason mm. I flag it up because of the use of the word "teaching people how to do something" as part of PKM. And I know. You've written a lot about the difference between training and, and, and modeling and shaping. So I thought that might fit in there. But, you know, can how do you, do you teach people how to, to, use, to, be, to do PKM? Or how, how do you help somebody with their PKM, in other words? Uh, yeah, no, I think that's an, that's an interesting point uh, from Jack, um, is that, how, yeah, how, how, do you, how do you teach people to do it? I am definitely a proponent of modeling versus shaping. And uh, so that how do I teach people about PKM is by doing it. And then by, and, and that's the share part of it. Is that so in the seek sense share model, if we all share, then we're all teachers. Then we're all showing what we do and people can learn from others. I mean, you take a look. Um, I was, my, my wife, the other day just uh, got a an old camera she's taking second year photography and it has a 35 millimeter um, nikon and uh, it was given to her and she hadn't used it before um, and then that's and she said well i'm not quite sure what to do with this and so what i said well let's check out youtube <laughs> so we went on youtube and there was this uh, master photographer who has the zen of photography and he had a couple of youtube videos that uh, showed things like how to load the film because this camera did us at a special way of, of, of doing film loading. Uh, so here was the master sh showing what was available. It wasn't a course or anything like that, but, but, but he was doing that. And I think that the more and more that you, you just imagine that within an organization, uh, that the more that you share, the more that you model the sharing and that you, you talk about those kinds of things. I think that that, that's, that, that's the teaching. If so, so, so yeah, it's that because we're all on a learning journey together, some of us are further ahead in one area than another. And, uh, and if we share, I think that we also teach as, as, as we do that. Yeah. And just as you said that Granny Smith said, if we all share, then we're all teachers. She loved it because it was so threatening to tradition. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I know. That's why I don't get invited to certain conferences anymore. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, the question that came up, um, and I haven't made a note who asked it, was, uh, maybe it was Brainy Smith, said, is curation a concept related to the three S's? Curation. They're, I mean, that's become a trendy word now, hasn't it? Content curation. So is it very, related? Very, very much. Very much so, and I'm using my, you're watching my PKM in action here. Um, there we have it. Okay, I just, I, I very recently wrote a blog post on PKM as pre-curation, and it was based on a conversation I had with Robin Good. Uh, Robin is in, um, is in Rome, and I had the joy of uh, finally meeting him after knowing him for 10 years. And he talked about curation and he made this very interesting mind map. So if you just, you can see this on my website here, or I can, we can stick it, I'll stick it into the chat and then that way everybody has it. Um, there, stick that into the chat. But it's where I look at Seek, Sense, Share as personal curation uh, is what we're doing. And that the similar skills in PKM are ones that are used if you're curating for an audience. So in PKM, you're doing it for an audience of one. And in curation, you actually have a defined audience. I'm curating for my work team. I'm curating for this group. I'm curating for this market kind of thing. So definitely Robin and I see uh, curation and PKM as, uh, as, as very much intertwined. I also noticed a question here, Jane, okay. uh, about introverts finding a voice in PKM. Yes. I yes. was just going to ask you that one myself. How might introverts find a voice? Very good question, I think. Um, I'm using a search function here, but I know that I have it stuck in here somewhere. Where is Sasha's 
uh, I, I switched to DuckDuckGo, and unfortunately, they're not as good as um, uh, there she is, the shy presenter. This is probably, I think, one of the best um, guides around. Uh, Sasha Chu, who works for IBM, I'm going to put this into the chat as well. Um, there we go. Um, has a number of presentations on uh, uh, the introvert and social uh, social media, social learning, social networking, and I think that. Um, uh, she probably covers it really well. One of the nice things about something about using social media, if you are an introvert, is that you don't have to do things in real time. And I think that 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 probably helps introverts a lot. Is that you is that you can you have time to think about your response before you post it. So finding a uh, let's say you might find something like uh, attending a tweet chat as a little too imposing because it's happening in real time. But writing a blog post once a week is something you can think about, reflect upon, and may not be as intimidating. So I think it's uh, for introverts, they just might be looking at uh, different types of tools. But I, I think definitely you, could, you can do it. And the thing is, you can start blogging in private if you want to, and then later you can start sharing. Brady Smith just answered, she can't wait to read it, love Susan Cain's quiet that inspired her question to you. So. Quiet. A book quiet, was that? Pain. If you look at the the tweet, uh, the t the Twitter chat, the tweet chat, you should see it there. If you refresh that, she's just coming. Yeah. Okay. Twitter. Yeah. Let me look at that. Make sure I have all here. Can't wait. Love Susan Cain's quiet. Oh, okay. Have to take a look. I haven't, I haven't read that yet. Definitely worth checking out. Okay. Okay. Well, it's another good question came in from Fiona. Hi, Fiona. Um, many organizations expect their employees to show expertise. So is there a perceived risk to learning out loud? Yes. If you work in an organization that doesn't embrace learning from mistakes, perhaps looking silly, um, and uh, uh, I would say that, pro or if you have a boss who lacks self-confidence, <laughs> um, so yeah, if you're in a dysfunctional, or, I mean, it's like a family. If you're in a, a highly functional family, is that they, uh, uh, you know, people laugh at each other, but it's like they they still love each other, and it's okay to make mistakes and, and everything. So if you're in an in an environment that that uh, allows that, then it's fine. But if you are in a dis, I mean, the problem with social media is that they make dysfunctional organizations more transparent. And so, yeah, I, of course, you have to be cognizant of the environment that you're working in. Okay, yeah. so we've got some recommendations okay. uh, on, on Quiet, the book. Yeah. That's good. Uh, yeah, I haven't heard of that one either, so that's what I'm going to be following up. Um, David mm -hmm. Wilcox asks, are there any tensions between PKM PLM and COP, uh, community of practice models, or do they complement or integrate? I think that there's probably, see, PLNs seem to be trying to have a bit of a turf war. Uh, my perspective on PKM is that there is no turf war uh, because I'm not trying to sell a PKM system. And I think that anybody who tries to sell you a PKM system, you should just show them the door uh, because there isn't one. Um, so in a lot of cases, these PLNs uh, are actually, you know, software packages that you that, that 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 you can buy, and so they're trying to stake that out. And I think that when you sort of commoditize that, the personal learning knowledge stuff is that you're you're, you're making a big. Uh, uh, I think you're making a big mistake, but then you're also getting into um, uh, vendor wars and things like that. Uh, communities of practice, I think that communities of practice are much more effective if the majority of the people are practicing some kind of knowledge sharing, some kind of personal knowledge management, personal knowledge sharing, personal productivity improvement, or whatever you want, whatever you want to call it. But they're actually sharing their stuff. They're narrating their work. Uh, they're engaging with other people. So I would consider PKM a base skill for effective communities of practice. And that's what I'm working on with uh, and have worked on with clients is getting people to practice some of those skills that work within their organization. 
and I think that's Jack picks up on this point and says, what about showing, helping, hand-holding? And I think that's basically what you're saying by modeling, isn't it? It's not about telling people how to do it, but showing and helping them how to do this. Uh, yeah. Apply their own. Yeah, I definitely agree. There was, um, I, I did a, an early MOOC a long time ago. We had about 700 people on it. And uh, one of the participants was actually uh, ran a uh, photojournalism program in uh, in the UK, and he uh, and these photojournalist students were they were mature students. Um, they'd already been photographers and they wanted to become photojournalists. And uh, but one of the requirements that he had was that everybody had to create a blog. And he talked about how he um, managed that blog process and and he managed them doing it and the term that he used was a gentle hand and i think that's really important is that that's what it takes it takes a gentle hand uh I, I, so yes it's mostly modeling the shaping is very very light touch kind of stuff suggesting things back and forth and helping people find their own path i think that that's really important because if they don't find their own path they're not going to stay on it they're not going to continue following it and that was the problem of speaking with Dave Pollard many years ago. Uh, Dave was the um, uh, ch uh, chief knowledge officer of Ernst & Young. And when he, he was looking at uh, a, 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 some kind of a PKM system for the, the folks working at Ernst & Young, and he said that nobody cared what was in the corporate knowledge base. They cared about their desktop, their screen, their desk, their, and, and that was it. And that that was the personal side of it. And no one cared about keeping the corporate knowledge base up to date. And so I think that what's important is that uh, my, my future that I see for knowledge management is that everybody using personal knowledge management and then having ways in which you can aggregate, federate, and harvest this uh, in, in, in a way that doesn't take away from anyone's personal workflow or their, or their, uh, from, from their daily routine. So that's that's where I see that's why I see the potential of it, but I just don't see that in many organizations yet. Um, which begs the question in organizations how they help people because they've been they've been you know learning development traditionally not the gentle hand is it the heavy hand of telling you what to do and how to do it in a very you know, very uh, dogmatic way shall we say autocratic way. So um, how is it how is this going to scale to it... um, organizations? To helping people develop their own personal knowledge management practices? I think it scales by starting with a small group of uh, uh, keen, dedicated, interested, curious people, getting them to find out what practices work within the context of that environment, because every business, every organization is different. And that if you can get a group of a dozen or so people, work with them for a while, get them to find out things that work, and they can start modeling the behavior, and then they can start spreading the word out as it goes. Um, that's what we used with a, a, um, uh, with, a, with, with a health services company. We had about 12, 15 people in the initial one, and that went out to about 40 people. And that seemed to be, it still took time, but I think that that's, that works a lot better than trying to come with some kind of a top-down, everybody will, everybody will do six uh, posts on Yammer per day or something crazy. And this is going to assume that, uh, that a very different role then for traditional learning development departments, which have been very much focused on this top-down approach to training, well, which is now going to be much more about supporting learners, the grassroots, helping one another to do things and support one another as they do them. So yeah. um, how do you think this is going to play out in many of those traditional organizations which still see things as telling people what to do and how to do it? Well, I mean, we worked with an organization last year that had reduced its corporate university from 150 people to 40 people. Um, you're seeing slashing and burning of, uh, of training and development organizations because in a lot of cases they don't provide the value that the business wants. So I think that you're going to be um, uh, 
it's not going to be training who's going to be running this stuff. Um, PKM, I, I talk to software developers about stuff like PKM. It's like, duh, we do it already. Okay. <laughs> you know, uh, they're, they're, they're already there. And I mean, the, one of the reasons I got into PKM is I started this um, almost 10 years ago uh, because I had just started working for myself. And I no longer had a budget to travel. I no longer had, uh, you know, someone paying for my professional development. Um, and I, and, and uh, you know, I was looking at, you know, total costs of three, four thousand dollars to attend a big conference and, you know, do these connections. And I had to figure out how do I stay current in my field cheap? And PKM was it PKM that the, starting on that? Is it okay? Who do I connect? To? Who's offering stuff for free? Who is sharing already? Who are the experts? How can I engage with that? How can I show my expertise? And part of that was I can show that I am learning, and that by learning out loud, other people connected with me. People, people like like Jack Vinson. I think we've probably been connected for ten years online. I'm thinking. Um, and other people like John Husband, and then, you know, folks like Dave Snowden, who have informed me a lot about complexity uh, theory. And, um, and, it, and it just seems it's like, um, uh, it's like you know, uh, kindergarten, you know, the more, you, the more you give, the more you get. And I think that then in terms of knowledge sharing, that's definitely the case. So uh, I, again, for me, is that if you're not doing some kind of PKM and you're working in an organization, and you get laid off is that where is your professional development network to help you keep connected and that and i've seen that with clients of mine who have been laid off uh, you know, after 17 years i was like harold help me i don't know who to connect with or what to do with on the stuff everybody i knew was inside the company and you know they're gone i'm not connected to them anymore so it's a survival skill for the networked era as far as i'm concerned And uh, as a couple of people on Twitter have said, how do I stay current for cheap? Question mark PKM. It is cheap. So, um, yep. <laughs> yeah. We are not selling you any software. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, not indeed. Uh, Jeff Horace says, when I think out loud in meetings, I have to notify members of it or they get very. <laughs> Yeah, that's why sometimes it's better to sort of take your little uh, your pad with you and just and and, and, and type out loud instead and, uh, and 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 see where that goes. But I mean, you think about that, you know, thinking out loud, and you're looking at things like how the Twitter back channel or some other back channel has changed the nature of a lot of conferences. You know, where people get taken to task right there when they are talking and saying, you know, this guy's, you know, here's a reference that you know refutes exactly what the speaker is saying. So I think you're just going to see more and more that it's the reality of our network world. And what PKM is, I mean, I, I, I've also called it network learning. How do you learn in networks and with networks? So we're getting closer. Are there how we? Oh, oh. go ahead, go ahead, Jen. I was just going to say, Brainsmith makes tweets that starting PKM means admitting we're currently doing it wrong, very threatening to adults in hierarchies where image counts. Yes, it is. It is. It is. It, well, I mean, Kutra and Manifesto said it right, hyperlinks subvert hierarchy. So hierarchies and so hyperlinks, PKM, networks, subvert traditional top-down, sage, sage on the stage, I am uh, the, whole, the whole notion of knowledge transfer, which I think is a lot of crap. Uh, uh, it's, it subverts all of that. It's, it's being subverted. I think that's what we have to realize. It's, 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 it's that this is, this is happening, and, and how, can how can we, we uh, 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 sort of look, go, take, advantage take advantage of this? And how, and how can, can we become a more resilient knowledge network, whether it's the BSV fashion fashion, the the organization and constitution, and it's the reality of the not not and all the people that you saw outside of the organization to be to be able to be able to walk and master master. I'm interrupting you because your yeah, voice yeah. is starting to break up. I don't know if you can see the questions in the chat. At the chat there saying you could. Distorted, I don't. I don't. But, um, that's, that's interesting. Why I'm, I'm still seeing everything clear. Clear. All the signals here. It may just be maybe it's maybe not the headquarters. You now sound like you're in a underwater and it's. Uh, lots of bubbles coming up. So. Oh, boy. Okay, let's just slow down. Slow down. You, you, I'm going to mute, and you can talk for a second, and then you'll pick up. Pick up. Okay. Um, 
Okay. Harold's, Harold's on mute while he tries to sort his um, uh, sound out. He's going to unplug and he's underwater and on Mars indeed. And um, lots of good questions coming in and points on Twitter. So uh, keep them coming in. Uh, Har question to Harold was how many hours do you spend on PKM per day, per week? And um, I don't know about Harold, but uh, personally, you know, this is part of my my everyday work. I, I couldn't possibly talk about everything I know about what's happening, or what I think is not happening happening in the in the industry and profession without this being an enormous part of my daily job. And it's something that I enjoy as well. So I don't see it as a chore. I just see it as just part of what I do. And I, I have a drip feed of stuff coming in in my my part. You know, I have Twitter open all day. I have Twitter open sending me messages, email open. I have Google Reader open. And, you know, I just sort of see it out of the corner of my eye as things come in. And so I don't actually consciously think I'm spending time on it, but it's just a, a continuous stream, if you like, of uh content coming into my into my eyes and my brain and you know i look look at something and if i think it's important i'll go through it i'll go deeper into it otherwise i'll just forget it and move on to the next thing now that's just the way that i personally have started to work and so i don't focus on say doing it one task and then move on to twitter and then back to another onto another task it, it all has rather kind of got very integrated in, in my brain but that's just how i how i work now i i understand that many people don't like to work like that wouldn't want to work like that they like to sort of very focus on tasks but um for me i think it's become a, a, a very important and key way for me to keep up to date with what's going on and i really probably couldn't do do without it anymore and i guess many of you out there to do it do that all the time and it, you just take it for granted now that's the way you work that you have these things open in your desktop and they're in the background you might turn them off when you you do need to focus on something but they're just part of who you are nowadays and I and I think for those people who it isn't part of their daily routine it's not something that comes to them naturally that it's quite a difficult different way and approach to working but so how, when I help people I try to explain a little bit about the way I work but again as Harold has always said it you know it's very much about finding your own processes and techniques that work for you so you, I, for instance I don't tend to use things like bookmarking social bookmarking very much I tend to make notes of things in other ways on my, on my own website and, and other places but we all have different ways that we work so I don't know if you're back online now, Harold. Are you? Oh well, I've um, un I've unplugged. Unfortunately, I can't shut down go to webinar. You sound or... good okay. Now. So you'd like to answer that question, which uh, was asked: of how many hours you spend on PKM per day per week? Uh, you probably heard my reply, which is for yeah. me, it's just a constant stream, and I really couldn't say how many hours. I don't actually see it like that. It's just part of what I do. Yeah, and I. I... Uh, Jack made an interesting point is that you know the seeking part is probably an ongoing thing is that when you see something you have quick capture things I mean you can if you can see my screen here is that I have I have Digo which is one of my social bookmarks and if I wish to capture something so I go to um, here's some here's what I what uh, an article that I was looking at and is that I want to grab something I can just grab it quite easily and then I have this put into here. I can bookmark it. It captures it, and then I can put it under. I can I can add the tags in very quickly. I can save it, and that is now within my library, which is now searchable and I and and back and forth. So I mean, this is one of the simplest tools. Is is that part? So I think that part just sort of happens within the flow. The sense making part. Um, you know, I, I try to write a blog post a day, five days a week, um, and that's part of my, my workflow. But, you know, th that's, part of, that's part of my business. Um, so, but if I was in a, in a job and I was, 
uh, I might want to uh, write my blog posts uh, once a week or something to the people working for me, right? To my team about uh, uh, you know s some issue that has come up, and maybe I put things together, and we're going to be talking about because we're really interested in social learning. So I'm going to do a number of social learning things on how it relates to our organization, uh, so that it might be actually part of my workflow in that way. So yeah, I would say that you know hardcore an hour a day because that's probably the blog post and you know you know a few things on twitter and that kind of stuff but it really depends i think for different people and when i'm on site with clients sometimes it's, it gets down to zero exactly and i think it's important that you know you shouldn't feel you have to do something every day you know sometimes i go in and i just mark as read everything in my google reader i don't even look <laughs> i do that all the time <laughs> it's quite liberating isn't it um, you know, oh yes come back if it's important it'll come back to you in some other form somewhere else so you haven't really got it doesn't really matter no but uh, if you've got the time you can do it if you haven't got the time just get on with something else and christine Krager here makes a very good point pkm needs to be part of daily work not in addition to it i 100 percent agree with that and that when i work with clients or with workshop participants it's no, it's trying to figure we have to get that what's in it for me part all right why is this going to be any better and that either has to help you do something a lot better or it has to take away something that you don't want to be doing so let's say if blogging can reduce your email then there's a motivator to be doing blogging instead or if social bookmarks are going to help you save addressing questions or something to people on a regular basis then okay i've got that behind it um, so the the hard part is getting from the oh that's an interesting idea and then connecting it into your daily practice because quite often you have to do it for a while to find out if it's any good and that's why I suggest to people is to try one tool or one type of practice for a while. See if it works. And if it doesn't, dump it. Try something else. So that's part of the being curious and always testing out new tools. Um, I try to test out, you know, uh, a new tool every couple of months. Just try something different like Evernote, which I don't use, but at least I played with it and I have an understanding of how, how it goes. We're getting close to the end of the time there, I think. Yeah, now, ho hopefully the recording will uh, have better audio. I hope so. Um, quick, quick question here, boy. Not really quick, but Chris Osterai says, suggestions for filtering the interesting from the important. I've been working hard on staying aware to avoid rabbit holes. And, um, <laughs> yeah. It's easy to get sucked down those rabbit holes, doesn't it? Uh, and sometimes you uh, can avoid the rabbit holes and avoid some of the important stuff, but uh, it just comes with a, just time, doesn't it, really? Time, but I mean, I look at it, and sometimes time in the short term as well. So I, I have a thing called Friday's Finds, which are the interesting things that I found on Twitter for the last week. And what I do is when I'm on Twitter and I find something that's interesting, is all I do is I favorite it. I don't do anything else. I just favorite it. And then Thursday night, Friday morning, I go through the last week of my Twitter favorites. And it's amazing how after a week later, let's say I have 50 that I favorited, I realize that there's only about three or four that have any value. And they're the ones that I write a blog post on. Uh, so having a quick way to sort of do the first level and then having a time gap to do the second level, I think helps you sort of separate the wheat from the chaff a little bit. So I think, so, so putting in time breaks without losing uh, your workflow, I think is important. Uh, just, just looking at some final um, tweets coming in. Uh, well, somebody who's not actually been, is not on the webinar, but it's fun that just following the tag has been learning from it from that. So that's pretty good, I think. Learning uh, out loud, uh, yes. Yeah, exactly. Learning from everything that we've been talking about. So that's great. Okay, uh, yes. Uh, uh, Brainy Smurf asked about PKM buys back time. I'll send you the link to that one. I think you're, you're looking at the uh, reduction in email and things like that. Maybe I'll, I'll send you a link to one of my blog posts. I think it's just it's a matter of trying these things, isn't it? I mean, I guess for many new people coming into it, it's scary. You know, well, where do you start? What do you do? Where do you, where do you, which tools do you use? 
So if you had to say one tool then, Harold, that, you know, start with this one. If, if somebody is asking for some advice, you know, where should I start? What should I do? What would you say? I think the easiest type of tool to start with is uh, social bookmarking. Um, so a delicious or Digo would be two of the ones that I would suggest. And because what it does is it gets rid of all those bookmarks that are only a, or, or, or favorites that you have in your browser. It moves them to the web, it makes them searchable, and it makes them shareable. And I think that that as a first step is, uh, uh, I, I think that you'll realize something from it, is use social bookmarks. If, you, if you're using other things, you may not need them, but if you're not doing anything, social bookmarks is, I think, a good place to start. And there is a um, Common Craft video on uh, social bookmarking. So just, uh, you can, that's a 10 minute video, um, which we should be able to find that one. Social, I think it's social bookmarking in plain English, right, Jane? Maybe I lost Jane. Uh, sorry, yes, I just uh, muted myself. That's right. Yes, so, that's could right. you just re remind people then uh, what they will be doing in, during the month as a workshop participant? Uh, Paul has asked that question. I know you, you did spend a, a slide on slide on that. Perhaps you could just reiterate what they will do. What will be happening during the rest of the month? Yeah. So, um, so this week is uh, the first assignment's already been posted, and uh, it's it's there to talk about uh, this week, and it talks about uh, PKM in general. Um, there's access to a fair number of resources to read through. Uh, I've got some job aids as well set up. Week two, we'll be talking about uh, tools a lot, about uh, specific types of tools, pros and cons, and things like that. Week three, finding your voice is uh, how do you make sense? What are the different ways of doing it? What works for you? And then the, the last part is about the network, is how do you build your network, nurture your network, connect to other networks? So uh, those are the, again, the seeking, the sensing, and the sharing, all those. And in between is that uh, having a month uh, of a number of people to talk to who are interested in it and and sharing and with myself of course having my attention there um, so that if uh, it we what we found over time is that it gives people a good opportunity to uh, uh, to dig down deep into what they're specifically interested in so it's and the thing is if you don't feel like doing an assignment you don't have to or you can do it later way later No deadlines. No. No money management systems. <laughs> no. <laughs> we'll, we'll have to we'll have to put a big sign up says called an LMS free zone. Zone, yeah. <laughs> so if anybody's got any, any other things like that, is that we'll be connected on uh, on Twitter. If you use the SLC webinar hashtag, then I'll be certain to see it, or you can just send me, send me a message. Um, and really appreciate it. So we've had, uh, we've kind of held the 63 number here, I think, through most of the of the presentation, right, Jane? It, it may have gone up a little bit more, but yes, probably yeah, about that. Yeah, around that. That's not too bad. Okay. Brilliant. Anyway, thanks to everybody for, for attending and participating, and hope this was of, of, of some value to you. And I, I will have this up recorded as soon as it does the conversion and I'll get it up on my YouTube channel and there will be a link also in the Social Learning Center. Thanks, Harold. Thank you, Jane. Really appreciate it. Thanks for um, uh, taking care of me when I was underwater. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right, take care. I'm going to stop bye. the recording. Okay, bye.